Amen. And now for the scripture reading and prayer. James, you again. I'm like, I'm like a bad we're habit. We're so blessed to have you. <laughs> this is what happens when they, they jump you in the hallway. <laughs> okay, everybody, are we excited? We appreciate these gentlemen. Yes, ma'am. I'm raising the mic up. <laughs> Heard my stomach growl, didn't you? Uh, uh, we appreciate these gentlemen being here. Let's all get excited like you had a ball game. I mean, yesterday, you know, my wife's dragging the recliner up to the TV for the basketball game. I mean, <laughs> she has to be so close to it when it's going on. All right. Let's, uh, let's get serious here. Isaiah 55, 6 through 11. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteousness man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are high, higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, there without watering the earth and making it bare and spout, sprout uh, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to, to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And everybody pray, not just me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for all your many blessings. We ask at this time you bless us with the word that's coming, and we ask that you speak out through them and open our hearts. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Though we're going to have help preaching here for a moment. I want to take this moment and introduce to you uh, George Fleetwood of the Gideons that have come to tell us what the Gideons are doing. Uh, George had been a Gideon for 47 years. Now, Gideons, you know, hold a near, dear place in my heart because I was a Gideon for about 17 years. In fact, I wore my Gideon pen uh, in honor of the Gideons being here today. But George has been a Gideon for 47 years. He's been on a number of international distributions uh, in Mexico, Peru, and Malawi in Africa. I guess you're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. And... Uh, uh, it's good to have them with us here today, and as I mentioned, at the end of the service, we'll be receiving an offering for the Gideons, and 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 I and having been a Gideon, one thing I can I can tell you with certainty, a hundred percent of what is given goes to purchase scriptures for distribution. I do know the administrative costs of the Gideons; they bear themselves, but all monies given goes to buy scriptures. Let us begin. Uh, He's got a short video he'd like to show, so go ahead and roll it, Dave. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing you, I find Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Your grace 
grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are I am free Holiness is Christ in me Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness who are Christian business and professional men, uh, members uh, of local churches recommended by their pastors who have received the Lord Jesus Christ into their life as their personal Savior, uh, are charged with placing God's word around the world. As you saw in hotels and motels, we place these full Bibles. Um, And what you saw on the screen is is a compilation of... of, uh, many thousands of letters that we get into our international headquarters telling us how God has, has used these Bibles. So Isaiah 55, 11 was read this morning, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It doesn't return void, but it accomplishes what the Lord wants it to accomplish. Uh, being a Gideon for all these years, I joined when I was a very young man, I've kind of gotten old, so everybody thinks Gideons are old men. Well, we were young once, <laughs> and uh, and I'm so appreciative of of your pastor allowing the Gideons to come and and Kerry King, who who is a member of our uh, Gideon organization, and he's he's one of the guys out there sneaking around at night, placing Bibles in hotels when nobody's looking. But not not really. Uh, we we do have that ministry, but we also have the ministry of placing uh, testaments uh, in the hands of military folks, um, in the hands of school children, and you're going to see a picture here uh, of a trip that uh, I was asked to go to Malawi. Now we were going from schoolyard to schoolyard, and we stumbled on this one school that was. So poor. You know what those kids are doing? They're actually doing their uh, arithmetic and studies in the dirt because they don't have any money to buy books or paper. And can you imagine when we got there and uh, were able to hand them a bound book, God's Word? It it really tears me up because I'm thinking about that. And uh, we had uh, other opportunities to go from classroom to classroom And uh, we would hand out the Bible, but the instructor said, just don't hand out the Bibles. Tell the students what's in it. So we would hand out the Bible. It says, in the beginning, presented to, and I would ask the students to write their name in it. Say, good morning, students. And they spoke English in Malawi. That's a language that's required. They have to learn by the time they're in fourth grade. And they say, good morning, sir. 
And I'd say, students, I'm here to present a copy of God's Word to you. Thank you, sir. And I'd say, you know, take the book out and write your name in the, in the front of the, life, the book, and that means this long book now belongs to you. And they would all take their pens out and write in it. And I would show them where to look for help so when they were afraid or anxious or whatever, there's a little index there that they can turn to verses. But in the back of the book, there's a plan of salvation. And I would have the freedom in, in a school, something we don't enjoy here, at least in the United States. We're too advanced for that, I guess. But um, anyway, I would explain to them the plan of salvation. And um, then I'd invite them to take their pen out. And I said, now you sign the, the front of the book. That means the book belongs to you. But if you sign the back of the book and you put today's date on it, that means your heart belongs to Jesus. And, uh, you know, whole classrooms of kids would pick up their pens and sign their names. And this went on one, two, three days. And I got back to my little hotel room that third day, and I'm thinking, Lord, am I doing the right thing? I mean, maybe these kids are just signing this book because... I'm supposed to pick this up. Sorry. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? I'm thinking, I'm not doing the right thing because these kids are picking this book up. Everybody signed it. They're just signing it. And uh, I struggled with that. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and uh, the vo- voice wasn't audible, but I just was impressed upon the fact that the Lord was saying to me, George, that's not your business. That's my business. You just present the gospel. And, you know, that's what we're called to do as Christians, to present the gospel, aren't we? And and it's the Lord's business who comes and receives him. Well, we uh, did the Malawi Blitz. um, And uh, over these years, I've been able to speak in many, many churches. I one thing that I'll never forget was, uh, and this goes back a few years ago, uh, I was invited to speak at a little country church, uh, and you probably figure it out, I'm from the north. <laughs> I, I grew up in New Jersey, but I married a gal from Panama City, and I finally got her home. <laughs> so anyway, but this was way up in the, the very tip of northern New Jersey, where Pennsylvania and New York and New Jersey come together. And uh, the pastor said, come on back to my study. I was early. And he said, I want to show you something. And he opened up a drawer. He pulled out uh, something wrapped in a white handkerchief. And I looked at it. As he unwrapped it, I could see it was a military testament. He said, I want to tell you about this testament. He said, it belonged to my son. He said, he grew up in his church. And when he got into high school, he quit coming And then after he graduated, he joined the Army. And the Army sent him, at that time, to the conflict in Vietnam. He said, one day we got a telegram that our son had been killed in action. He said, we were very distraught. Not only had we lost our son, but we felt he had gone out into eternity without ever making his peace with the Lord. And then the the Army uh, sent the boy's personal effects home. And this Bible was included in it. And in the back of the book, the boy had signed it and dated it. And he uh, passed it went on to, to thank us how much he appreciated that that young man had received the testament when he was in the military. You know, that story touched my heart because I can remember being in the Army and getting my copy. And maybe some of you <laughs> have served in the military and received a copy of God's Word also. Uh, God's word does not return void. It does accomplish which, which he pleases it. Now, this morning, the pastor said I had about 20 minutes, and I think I've used up about seven or eight. And I asked him if I could do something different. Uh, you know, we as Gideons are not supposed to preach. We're just supposed to share how the Lord's using his word. But this morning, I'd like to ask you, If somebody were to ask you, what, what is the story of the Bible? How would you summarize it? What, what's the story? Uh, Could you tell the story of the Bible? Well, you know, we as Gideons are handing out thousands of copies, a million copies every three to four days uh, around the world somewhere. But what's the story of this book? What's it it have to say? Well, 
Uh, last Thanksgiving, I was up in Columbus, Ohio. My granddaughter teaches 7th and 8th grade English there. And I noticed she had this chart on the wall. How do stories work? And you'll notice stories always begin with nice tranquility. They're perfect. And then there's conflict and tension. And the story gets into increasing problems. And there's crisis. And, and then there's rapid movement. And then if the story is... Uh, going to end in a, in, a, in a good way, and it goes back to perfect again. You know, if it doesn't end perfect, but uh, it, it ends in a, a terrible tragedy, we call that a tragedy story. That's a tragedy. But, you know, that's how the Bible works a little bit. There's one problem, many scenes, and there's people involved. There's the protagonist, the antagonist, and the foils. Um, let me illustrate. So, uh, Star Wars. You all remember Star Wars, right? So, who is the protagonist? Lucas, right? And who is the an antagonist? Dark Vader, right? And who are the foils? They were the, the storm. They were the stormtroopers. They only existed to be blasted into oblivion. You know. But, you know, that's the story. So now, let's look at the Bible. Who, who would be the protagonist? Who is the protagonist in the Bible? Jesus. God. Somebody say God, right? God's a protagonist. And who's the antagonist? The devil. the devil, Satan. And foils, well, that's us, unfortunately. <laughs> We're the foils. So... Understanding how that story works, let's look at how Genesis starts. It starts with everything being perfect. You know, a beautiful garden. Uh, it was green, beautiful plants, fruit trees, a river running through it. Climate was perfect. I kind of, you kind of know the climate. How do you know the climate was perfect? They didn't have to wear clothes, right? <laughs> with perfect climate. Well... You know, but then what happened? Satan fluttered in. Now, is there, a, is there a backstory to this Satan thing? Yeah, Isaiah, I believe, 14 tells us what happened. Uh, Satan was uh, created, uh, and he was like the top dog of, of all the angelic beings. He was number two in the kingdom, only second only to God. And what happened with Satan. He decided to rebel, didn't he? He decided, I want God's position. I want to be the top dog. And he figured it all out. But not only, you know, I had to be very clever, didn't he? Because he got a third of the angels. I mean, the angels had it pretty good up there. Or whatever that time was. Maybe there was no time back then. But uh, he got a third of the angels to follow him. And... God is omniscient, he's all-powerful, he, he's all-knowing, and, you know, he knew what was going on. And so when the devil was ready to, to attack God after he got all those, a third of, of heaven to follow him, what did God do? Well, was it like a hundred years war, or 70 years war, or 20 years war? No, I believe with one flick of his arm, he just flung Satan and his followers out of heaven. And Satan, Satan was pretty upset with that, I believe. He, in fact, he wandered around out of heaven for, for years. And then one day, God decided, I'm going to create a universe. I'm going to create a blue planet. And Satan's looking around, and he sees that blue planet. You know, he knows the color blue. He doesn't know what's going on because Satan's not all-knowing. And he comes and looks in that garden, and he sees God walking with Adam and Eve. Uh, they're, having kind of, they're kind of dating in the evening. They, they, they have a love affair, God and Adam and Eve. And, Adam, and uh, Satan figures... I'm going to get God now. I know how to do it. So he slithers in, 
And Adam and Eve are no match for, for Satan. You know, he was able to fool a third of, of heaven's angelic beings. And they fall and they sin. And sin enters in the world. And it gets worse. They have, Adam and Eve have children. And Cain uh, kills Abel. God said, there's sin crouching at your door. But Cain doesn't care. He kills his brother. And sin gets worse and worse and worse and worse as generation after generation uh, are born. And then finally, we have the flood. God says, I got to get rid of everybody here. He finds Noah. And Noah builds an ark. And he's saved with his family. And then what happens? The, 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 uh, the ark lands on dry land, and guess what? Noah gets drunk. Ah, oh, that's the best we got. A drunkard. But God says, I'm kind of tired of this. I think I'm going to have to choose a people for myself. So now we find, we find uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, what do you think about that family? Was that a functioning family? <laughs> well, you know, I stand in awe of uh, Abraham. He was a man of faith. But, you know, I don't think it went over too well when he went to Egypt and told the, the king that uh, his wife was his sister. I mean, it was probably a hard Valentine's Day uh, for him. Uh, yeah. but, but, you know, then we have Isaac and then Jacob. Now, Jacob was a piece of work. I mean, he, he stole his brother's birthright. Uh, he stole his, his brother's blessing. And then he, then he got, uh, had to flee because his family would kill him. His, his mother told him, get out of here because your brother's going to kill you. And he winds up and, and um, marries uh, somebody he thought he was going to marry, but it turned out to be her sister. <laughs> and then, you know the story. You know... And then you follow this story down the line, and sin is encroaching constantly. And, and then uh, God calls his people, and they, uh, they go to Egypt, and they're in slavery for all these years. And from slavery, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they disobeyed God. Ever look at the back of your Bible, the map of the Israel of wandering? It looks like a plate of spaghetti. <laughs> you know, all over the place. But, but God then calls uh, the, that nation to form itself, and, and they take over, and um, then they have kings, they, they have prophets, and then kings. We had Saul. Saul. We had David. You know, D David was a man after God's own heart, but, but he still messed up quite a bit. And then we had, um, who, who, follows, who followed him? Solomon, right? Solomon. Really smart guy, but not smart enough. He had about a thousand wives. I don't know how smart that was. And then the kingdom splits. You remember all that? And and you have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and and God wipes out the northern kingdom uh, when the uh, I think the Assyrians attacked them, and and that kingdom got wiped out, and the southern kingdom was carried off by the Babylonians. And then they were in captivity for years, all this because of Adam's sin, God's dealing with his people. And then what happens? I'm giving you the, the story of the whole Bible here. I'm sorry, Pastor, I think I'm going over time now. I'll shorten this real fast. But, but you know, there's, uh, there's a time uh, when the, they come back to the land, they rebuild the temple, and they rebuild the, the, their, the walls. And uh, it seems like the... The kingdom's on a good stretch. But then there's 400 years of silence. God doesn't speak at all. And then one day, God, an angel appears to, to Mary and says, tells them that Jesus will be born and, she, and she's a virgin. And, and Jesus is born. <clears throat> the kings come from the, the west. Or east, they came from the east, did they? And they and the, and they went to Herod. Now, 
that kind of was a stupid move because you don't go to a king and say, where is the next king of the Jews going to be born? I mean, Herod was a bad guy. In fact, it said Caesar. Caesar has said that uh, I'd rather be a, a sow of, of Herod's than a son because a sow had a better chance of, of staying alive. But Herod, Herod killed all those young children in, in an effort to get to, to, to uh, Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus. But, you know... Uh, Jesus was protected. He grew up. And, and then the next scene we see Jesus uh, going to the Jordan and being baptized by John. And the voice comes down from heaven. And what did that voice say? This is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. And I believe Jesus, our God, was talking. Satan was watching this. And he said to Satan, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Go at it. Go after a real man and see how you come out. And so Jesus was led out into the, the desert and the wilderness, and he was tempted, but the Satan didn't win, did he? Jesus didn't fall to, for the temptation. Satan was clever enough to tempt all these people all these years, but Jesus didn't fall for it. He, he remained sinless. And then... Satan figured out, remember, Satan's the antagonist. He's the guy that's trying to destroy the story. Uh, Satan figured out, well, I can't get to Jesus this way. I know what I'll do. I'll get to the religious leaders and get them to plot against Jesus. And that's what happened, isn't it? And we're coming into this season of, of Easter. Jesus was crucified on a cross. And... Uh, I would imagine that for three days, there was one big party in hell. Yeah. Satan figured out, I finally won. I killed Jesus, God's son. But then on Sunday morning, he went by the grave just to check on it. And the stone was rolled away, and Jesus wasn't in it. What had happened Jesus had risen, and I submit to you that the resurrection changes everything. Amen. The resurrection changes everything. We now have a standing with God because Jesus took our sins. We can be holy in God's eyes. And you know, Satan probably thought, you know all those times I thought I was winning? I was never winning. God had all this orchestrated out way before the foundation of the world. And so that's the story of the Bible. And I would submit to you, as you come into this Easter season, just think about the resurrection, what it, what it means, what it means to us that we now have a right standing with God. And, you know, I don't know, Satan, why don't you just give it up? You're finished. But... For some reason, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul thought we were living in the end times. Well, we are, because the history that we're living in is this section of time. Uh, and we're waiting for the second coming of Christ, aren't we? And I'm thinking, remember, uh, when Moses was given the uh, um, uh, authority to write the book of Genesis, you know, he describes the Garden of Eden, doesn't he? He tells about how green it was, and the water, and the plants, and what a pleasant place to live. But he's able to describe it. But when he, when he gives to, uh, John the uh, ability to write in Revelation of what heaven's going to be like, he can't even describe it. It's going to be so wonderful. I mean, he says it's like streets of gold, pearl gates. Uh, he, he just... There's no language to describe what heaven's going to be like. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has in store for us. That's the story of the Bible. That's why we give out Bibles. We want people to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he has prepared for those who love him. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, George. You know, there's quite a story there, isn't there? Quite a story. And, 
You know, as we look at the uh, the word, there is so much. There is so much in there, and in fact, uh, what I want to conclude and to back up what George was having to say here, we don't realize the power that we have in our hands if we would only read it. If we would only read it. You see, transformation happens when we read the Word. Transformation happens when we believe the Word. Transformation happens when we act on the Word and the Word that has been given and has come straight from God. Uh, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, I want to look at this morning. And it says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both the joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open your word, give us understanding. Open our hearts, our minds, our understanding. And Lord, as we look at your word, both in our hands and that are distributed around the world, we see you. We see salvation. We see Jesus. Lord, open our eyes this morning in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We live in a time where people question the Word. In fact, on Wednesday nights, I'm going through the science and the Bible, and a lot of people say, well, uh, the Bible's only full of metaphors because science shows us otherwise. Well, we're talking about that on Wednesday. Please tune in on Wednesday, uh, and, and, and I'll debunk that for you. But it says 63% of Americans say that this Word, the Holy Bible... Only 63% of them say that it is true. So the question I want to ask this morning is, what is the Word of God? What is the Word of God? What is this thing that we call the Bible? Well, I'm going to go through seven things very quickly this morning, so hang with me. Seven things. First of all, the Word of God is the piercing sword of the Spirit. In Ephesians 6, verse 17, we read, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Lord, a word of God. It strikes and arouses the awareness of one's immoral spirit, and it discerns the thoughts and motives of the heart. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Number two, the word of God is the reflecting mirror of life. Well... It reflects the kind of uh, person that we are. The Bible talks about right where we live. Uh, Romans 3, 10 through 12, we read this a couple of months ago. But it says, as it is written, and Paul is quoting from the Psalms. He says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. That's where we live. Romans uh, 3.23, we know that verse, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is where we are. Number three, the word of God is the burning fire of conviction. As we read the scriptures, it points out these things that are no good within us, the sin within us. It burns and consumes the heart. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word, this is God speaking, Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock. Do you remember the story after Jesus' death and resurrection, the two men walking to Emmaus? Walk into Emmaus, and, uh, and, and Jesus was expounding the scriptures to them. And when they recognized Jesus, Jesus left them. And it says in Luke 24, verse 32, they said to one another, Were our hearts, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So the word of God burns us with conviction. Number four, the word of God is the nourishing food of the believer. Peter writes about this in 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. He says, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, 
so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. The believer grows and lives and is built up through the study of the Word. Uh, we can't live apart from the Word. This is God's Word to us. And, and, and remember, you know, as you mentioned about the Jesus being tempted by the devil, you remember what Jesus told the devil. Now, make no mistake here. The devil knows the Scripture better than you and I put together. <laughs> But it's important for us to know the word. Jesus said, and he said that he answered. He answered the devil in Matthew 4, 4. And it says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Number five, the word of God is a guiding light for the believer. Uh, we sang that, you know, thy word is a light to my feet, Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It shows us the way. Number six, the word of God is the cleansing water of sanctification. The prayer in the garden that Jesus prayed before he went to the cross, he prayed in John 17, verse 17, he said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. God washes and cleans his own. The church through the use of the word. Uh, Paul, when he was talking about husbands and wives and their relationships, and relates it to the church. And, and in Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, he says, Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her, by the washing of the water with the word. We are to wash ourselves in the word. And number seven, and this is not maybe the last, but it's of primary importance. Number seven, the word of God is the pointer to Jesus. Jesus said in John 5, verse 39, he says, You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Only in Jesus do we have eternal life. What did Jesus say? We know these verses. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no life apart from Jesus. The word of God is all this and more. This is not a complete list, but we, we need to realize that the word is all about Jesus. And that brings us to our focal verse. Hebrews 4.12 says, For that the word of God is living. Living. Let's stop there for a moment. The word of God is alive. The word is not dead. It is not sleeping. It is not mere words on a page. We cannot ignore the word. Not only that, we'll be held accountable for the word that we know. John uh, James chapter 1 verse 22, James tells us, prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deludes themselves. Next, it says that the word is not only alive, it says the word is active, active. If you've got the King James, it says it is powerful. And actually, the Greek word here is the word energis, which, from which we get the word energize. You remember the energizer bunny, you know? It, and, and, and that's where we get our word energy or energizes, if you will. And, and it will accomplish all that God has set for it out to do. Uh, as, 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 uh, as James read earlier and, and, uh, and George mentioned, Isaiah 55, 11. These are good memory verses, by the way. 55, 11 says, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. This is the Lord speaking. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that, uh, accomplish what I desire and with, and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. God's word has purpose and it will have energy. It will accomplish what God sends out to do. 
And we also read that the word of God penetrates. Uh, back to Hebrews 4.12, it says, Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both the joints and the marrow. The sharpened two-edged sword. It's, it, it's interesting to look at it in the Greek, but it means a sharp sword. But it's a sword that cuts, cuts coming and going. It swings your way. It swings my way. It, it's throughout the Bible we find that the word is described as a sword. It's a weapon. It says that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. We read earlier. Revelations 1.16. We read about Jesus as his right hand he held the seven stars. And out of his mouth came what? A sharp two-edged sword. And the point is, uh, it, we, we take it too lightly. It is with the sword of his mouth, Jesus will strike down the rebellious nations of the world. Revelation 19, verse 15, it says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. But with that sword, with the word of God, it penetrates the very core of our being. Dividing the soul and spirit. What is the division between soul and spirit? I don't know. Can we divide it? No. It's in par- it's in 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 personable. It, you can't divide it. Okay. It's indivisible. But the Lord, but the Word of God will divide between the two. And and as I said earlier, it will show us for who we really are. And 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 I have to tell people, uh, you know, I've had people. Excuse me, I've had people tell me, well, I've read the entire Bible, yet they live like the devil. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to have to say, well, you're a liar. You haven't read the Bible. You haven't really read it. Uh, I understand uh, they may have read it, but they have may have deliberately chosen to harden their hearts against God. In fact, if you read through Hebrews, especially chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews, uh, it, it's a warning about hardening your heart. Three times the writer of Hebrew quotes from Psalms 95. In Hebrews 3, verses 7 and 8, we read, he says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, and he's quoting from uh, from the Psalms here, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, reflecting on what we had talked, what George had talked about, the people wandering in the wilderness and drawing those spaghetti charts and the maps in the back, you know, of, of all the wanderings back there. Lastly, the word of God judges. Back to Hebrews 4.12, and it says, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word able to judge in the Greek is the word kritikos, which we get our word to criticize or to be critical. And in fact, the root word kreitz is often translated as judge. God judges the thoughts and intents of our heart. And, and we need to understand as humans, our makeup is often a contradicting assortment of motivations, spiritualities, wants, lusts, desires, ambition, selfishness, thoughts, love, hate, charity, concerns, worries, and the list goes on. And it's all conflicting. And those who justify their actions by saying, well, God knows my heart. I tell you what, that's a true statement. And it's frightening. It's frightening. God knows the very depths of my heart. Whenever we hold a secret, the word tells us that God's word will lay it bare for his inspection. This is further commented on the verse that follows in Hebrews 4.13. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Or in, in the King James says, to whom we have to give an account. Everyone, everyone, and you've heard me preach this time and time again. Everyone will stand before Jesus one day. Everyone. And all the books and all the records of every thought and action will be laid open for all, for us to see with God. 
And God explains this. He, and in Revelations 20s, the unsaved, the condemned, will stand before the great white throne judgment. You can read that in Revelation 20. Those that are saved, we will still come before judgment in the judgment seat of Christ. And, this, uh, and, and, and the word tells us some will go into heaven and may not have any rewards. They are, uh, as they, they survive as through a fire. They, but yet they're still saved. It's where rewards are given. Second Corinthians 5.10, if you care to look that up. The word of God lays it all bare. Wouldn't it be nice to know how you stand up to God? How you measure up before God? If you want to see what God sees in you, you got to go to the word. If you want to see what God requires of you, you need to go to the Word. Do you want to see what God's will is for your life? We need to go to the Word. And do you want to know God? You need to go to His Word. And the Word tells us about Jesus and leads us to Him. We don't go to God unless we go through Jesus. In John 1 verse 45 uh, we read about Philip. It says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And if you have looked at the word and you have read the word and you haven't come to know Jesus, you need to go back and read some more. <laughs> the word points us to Jesus. The word will lay bear your soul before him and and it's and it's only natural as our souls lay bare for us to come to Jesus begging for mercy begging for forgiveness and to be accepted by him we're going to sing a hymn here in a moment tell us the story of Jesus you understand that the story of the bible is the story of Jesus And we're called to proclaim that to the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, may it penetrate our lives and may through the word that we will see Jesus today. Lord, touch us. Lord, may may your word draw us to you. And Lord, may someone today, whether they're here or listening online... Lord, if they have not come to know Jesus, maybe they be drawn to you today. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.